Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all of my lectures and post them on YouTube in the hope that they will support my students with evergreen content and working professionals and maybe encourage people to do STEM. I'm all about trying to make things accessible. Let's talk about hypothesis testing. Now, I've already provided some lectures on hypothesis testing, but what I did was I worked up a real cool demonstration in Python, an interactive demonstration for the test of difference in means. And I wanted to go ahead, provide a couple slides, and then walk through that, answer some really interesting questions. I thought this will help make this topic much more accessible. So let's take the problem. The problem is this. You are working in some type of a space, time, actual space, this could be X and Y, and you have multiple samples available to you. Okay, and you've got the sample set that's the black samples. You've got the samples here that are red. I picked those colors. I figured they should work well with people who are colorblind. And we have taken those data, and when we pull them together and build a distribution, we get sample one, sample two. And guess what? They look different. Now, the question is, are they different? The sample statistics are different. A sample mean, 15% for the red sample, and the black sample has a sample mean of 17%. So either one of two things is happening here. Either you have a the underlying population distribution for this entire area is wide. We happen to get a bunch of samples that are high here, just lucky. And here we have a bunch of samples here that are low, just unlucky. And the result is that they look different, but actually the underlying distribution is this. In other words, the difference in the distributions is not meaningful. Or the other thing that could be happening here is that we in fact have two distinctly different distributions for different parts of this region data set. The difference may be just due to random outcomes. And the problem is that because the false belief in the law of small numbers. We expect every sample set to be representative of the underlying population in all of their statistics. So the problem here is that the difference may be just a random outcome from the same distribution, or it could indicate two distinct populations. We need to try to infer what's going on. That's the whole idea of hypothesis testing. We go ahead and we set up a null hypothesis, which is that the population parameter of interest, the mean, population mean, is equal. In other words, sample set one, sample set two, actually come from populations that have the same mean. The alternative hypothesis is that they're not the same, and that would suggest the differences are significant, indicating there's possibly two populations to two different means. How do we do this? We're gonna calculate a test statistic. We'll use the T statistic from the student T distribution. It's going to be the measure, which will be the difference in the means, divided by the standard error. Now, the standard error is really cool because it's, in fact, the dispersion we would expect on the theoretical sampling distribution. We would expect for the same problem, same number of samples, as far as the differences we would observe due to random effect, with the null hypothesis being true, if we were to gather multiple samples and repeat that over and over again. Okay, and we'll show you, we'll even do it by bootstrap to show you that. And then what we do is we know that theoretical distribution, we know what it's gonna be, and we're gonna go ahead and get the T critical value. That's not a big deal because all we have to do is go to the student T distribution, use the alpha level we want to work with, the probability of exceeding the upper and lower bound, and the degrees of freedom which come directly from the problem, and we can go ahead and get the critical value. Okay, so we got the theoretical distribution shown right here. We've got the critical value, lower bound, upper bound, and we calculate the T statistic as mentioned right here in part one, and we can put that value and determine whether or not we're within the upper and lower bound. If we're outside of the bounds, we'll go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. If we're within the bounds, we'll say we fail to reject, and the null hypothesis will live to fight another day. <laughs> That's a scientific method. Okay, so the equations for this are not too bad. The actual T-statistic 
is just simply, as I mentioned before, the measure divided by the standard error. And we look up the T critical value. We'll go ahead and we'll use the alpha level divided by two since we have a two-tailed test. And we have, of course, this new value for degrees of freedom. In the Welch's t-test for difference in means with unequal variances, the degrees of freedom are a little bit complicated. We won't spend any time explaining the degrees of freedom right here, but suffice it to say that it integrates the idea of the number of data that are involved. And that makes perfect sense when we're talking about degrees of freedom. But it's also going to account for the overall dispersion within the problem. So these are the equations. Now, a lot of people get confused about what exactly is going on. So let's work up an interactive example in Python where the way it works is as follows. You have a dashboard here. You can change the number of samples in sample set one. You can change the mean and the standard deviation. And these are assuming a Gaussian distribution. And what this is doing is that when you specify the number of samples, the mean standard deviation, the program will then draw that many samples from that Gaussian distribution and make a data set. And then it's done. It's done. It made that data set. So this is the data set right here, the red data set shown by the histogram. Then you specify the number of samples, the mean, and the standard deviation of the second sample set, and it makes a distribution. This step is simply to give us some data to work with and allows us to change the number of data, to change the differences in the means that we'll be observing between the two different sample sets and the dispersions we'll be observing. And then we can watch and see how this impacts the result. Okay, so we got two sample sets. Now we're ready to proceed with our test. The next step is we'll calculate the Welch's T test, sampling distribution, the analytical expression, for the difference in means given the null hypothesis. Okay, so not a big deal. We use the equations from the previous slide. We calculate the T statistic, the T critical values. We assume an alpha level right here. You can use any alpha level you like. And the outcome from this is the red line, the specific sampling distribution we expect from theory, the student T distribution shown right here for difference in the means given the null hypothesis is correct. The T critical values are shown by the shading. The regions outside of the, T of the upper and lower bound are shown here. So that's one half alpha, one half alpha right there. And the actual T statistic is calculated right here. Okay, so we actually have the solution based on those previous equations. And we can right here, we'll see that we would have rejected the null hypothesis because the actual observed T statistic is outside of that interval. Now, what we also did, I took those two sample sets and I shifted them so that they had the mean equal to the average of all of the data together. That causes the null hypothesis to be correct. Then I went ahead to perform L bootstrap realizations from this data drawing with replacement from the data sets, calculating the T statistic realizations, and then formulated the empirical sampling distribution by using bootstrap. The blue histogram is the bootstrap distribution. Spoiler alert, it looks a lot like the analytical expression as it should. And then I just simply looked up the P alpha divided by two and the p one minus alpha divided by two the percentile values from this empirical distribution blue lines blue lines and i got the bounds empirically from bootstrap and the t statistic of course you just use the regular data like we did before put it in the equation and we get the actual t statistic and you can see the result there now we have a really really nice workflow where we can observe the effect of changing some things specifically what we're going to do is we're going to open up that workflow right now and we're going to look at a few things. I want to look at what happens when we change the sample size for data set one and two, n1 and n2. What happens when we change the sample means for data set one and two? We make them further apart from each other or closer. And what happens as we change the st sample standard deviations? For data set one and two, we create more dispersion or spread or less and so forth. We'll look at what happens with the alpha level. And finally, we'll change the bootstrap realization. So let's go ahead and open up the code and do that. So now we've gone ahead and we open up the code. The code is available 
on the link that will be shown in the comment for this video. So anybody can go ahead and try this out, follow along with me. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So we have some basic settings right here. Let's go ahead and start working through some of those things we want to check. Okay, first of all, you'll notice that we have the means are equal to each other. The result is that we have two sample sets which have very similar means and we have the T statistic is basically very close to zero. If you think about the numerator in that calculation would be very close to zero because the differences in the means are close to zero. So that is not unexpected. Let's go ahead and introduce some difference between the two so that now we're able to make some observations which will be more meaningful as we change the things we want to change. Okay, so first of all, watch the analytical expression for the sampling distribution for the difference in means given by the Welch's t-test and its expression. Watch the bars which represent the distribution sampled by bootstrap and watch these upper and lower bounds and let's go ahead and change the number of data. First of all, let's try changing the number of data to be very low. Let's just drop that down. Just watch what happens. Watch the distributions. Did you see something happen? If you look really carefully, you'll see that the analytical distribution actually started to get fatter tails or more density in the tails. This is fascinating. What's going on here is you imagine the student T distribution. We are dropping the number of data. We are dropping the degrees of freedom. The distribution is getting thicker tails at that point. So that's really, really interesting. And the net result is that these intervals are being pushed out further for the same alpha level. Okay, let's go ahead and try the opposite. Let's increase the number of data dramatically. And look what happened. Takes a little bit to calculate. And what you can see is that we're starting to lose density on the tail. The distribution is starting to thinner tails. The intervals are coming in a bit. The distribution is starting to become more Gaussian. So changing the number of data is gonna change the behavior of the distribution or shape of the distribution going from a student T distribution with very large tails or high density in the tails to being a distribution with very, a very Gaussian like behavior. Okay, so that's the first observation. Let's go ahead and drop this down to a more moderate level of data. You notice how as we're dropping the number of data, the actual T statistic is coming inwards. And this is fascinating too, because what's actually happening as we increase the number of data, the observed difference between the means of six and three starts to become more meaningful as you have more data. Let's continue to drop the data and observe this effect one more time. We're going to smaller number of data. Watch what happens with this. The T statistic is starting to come inwards and starting to become insignificant. We don't have enough data. This could be due to random effect now. Okay, this is really, really interesting. I want you to notice that while we've changed the shape of the distribution, the actual variance of the distribution did not change. It still has a mean of zero and a variance of one, which makes sense. There's no reason to believe the sampling distribution for the difference in means would be skewed one way or the other. And the variance is in fact equal to one because the calculation for the T statistic is standardized by the standard error for the problem. And so that forces the variance to be equal to one. I have many students who ask when they look up a T critical value, what mean and variance should they use? It's standard, it's forced to be zero one. Okay, now we've changed the number of data. Let's go ahead and change the observed effect and this should make a lot of sense. We'll keep increasing it. Look at that, we see our distribution shifting further away. The red distribution is going further away from the yellow distribution. And look at over here. The T statistic is going further and further out. They're becoming more significant in their difference. And that makes sense. Let's take the yellow distribution, the second sample set, shift its mean. And you can see the T statistic cross across and then becomes significant on the other side. The difference in means is now significant on that other side.
Now let's change the standard deviation of the sampling distributions. The first thing we'll do is we'll narrow them up a bit and see what happens and how significance changes. We change standard deviation, you see that the red samples will start to come in, they'll become a narrower distribution. If you look really carefully, this distribution has not changed. In fact, changing the mean, changing the standard deviation did not change the sampling distribution. All it did was change the T statistic. And as we go narrower and narrower, and we'll change the yellow distribution too, you'll see it becomes more and more significant. The P value is starting to dive now, and it's gone off the side of the page. Now let's go the opposite direction. Let's make the sampling standard deviation very wide. So now we have a very wide distribution. We're seeing all kinds of variants. Well, guess what should happen? Look at the T statistic. Let's go ahead and increase the variance within the yellow sample set, sample set two. And this distribution doesn't change. Once again, it is standardized by the standard error, which accounts for the standard deviation of the two sample sets. All that's changing is the T statistic. And if we go wide enough, now that observed difference in means of 13 to 18 is not going to be as meaningful because there's so much spread in the data. Here we go. Let's see if I keep going, keep going. Can I get it wide enough? It's going to be close. All right, I'm within the bounds for the analytical distribution. The bootstrap distribution, which is resampling, isn't quite showing it's significant, but it's very close. Okay, now let's go ahead and it's going to be very simple to do this. Let's change the alpha. Now I've been using an alpha 3%, which is not, you know, alpha 0.03, not very typical. Usually people will use an alpha of 5, 2.5%, 2.5% on the tails, but of course, if I change this, I can use any value I want to use. Typically, we use 5%. Let's go ahead as we increase that, look what happens. You can see these intervals are moving in. The bootstrap intervals are moving in. If you look carefully, the analytical upper and lower bound are moving in. They're shown by the shaded region right there. That makes perfect sense. And one more thing, let's move it back to the alpha level five, which is a good one to use. It's commonly adopted. Let's go ahead and see what happens as we change the number of bootstrap realizations. Pay attention to these blue bars. Those are bootstrap realizations. Let's go ahead and just grab it and move it all at once. Move it again. Let's go from 100 to 1,000. If you look really carefully, what's actually happening is the bar, are the bars are starting to do a better job of approximating the analytical solution. In other words, the whole idea of bootstrap and L, the number of realizations, is simply to have enough realizations to be able to sample the distribution. All right, good. So this was a very simple dem hands-on demonstration of hypothesis testing for the case of difference in means. This interactive display or interactive Python is available to you and I'll provide the link in the comment for the video. And I hope this is helpful to people trying to understand, grasp the concept of hypothesis testing. It's all about understanding when a difference is significant with regard to a statistic between two different sample sets. And this is very powerful because I'll tell you what, in many of the problems I work in, and things always look different. We need to know if there's significance in the differences. Okay, I hope this was helpful. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I teach and conduct research in spatial data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. Everyone stay safe. Bye.